There's no 7 in 64. It's Final Fantasy 7 on N64 Gaiden, Episode 1. looked at the ways in which Nintendo 64's first party launch lineup effectively defined the console. Aside from their lack of four player support, Super Mario 64, Pilot Wings 64, and Wave Race 64 did much to make a case for the system's capabilities. Yet in many ways, the N64 ended up being defined during its lifetime as much by what it wasn't as by what it was. It wasn't anywhere near as big a success as its predecessors. At 33 million units sold worldwide, it was barely half as popular as the 8-bit NES. It certainly failed to live up to its predecessor's legacy in its homeland, trailing desperately behind PlayStation and barely punching on par in Japan with the benighted Sega Saturn. It ran on cartridge-based media, while the rest of the industry had moved on to high-capacity optical discs. It failed to attract much love from longtime third-party partners. Its library was as minuscule as its sales when compared to its contemporaries and its predecessors. And it lacked much representation in core Super NES genres like 2D platformers, traditional shooters, and of course, role-playing games. All of these things are related, and all of these things came to a head with Final Fantasy VII. One of the single greatest commercial and corporate coups Sony ever managed to accomplish for PlayStation. Final Fantasy VII, by all rights, should have been a Nintendo 64 game. Prior to its 1997 debut, every Final Fantasy title to date had appeared exclusively on a Nintendo console, outside of an MSX port of the original game. Square had built its fortunes on Nintendo hardware, honing the technical and creative ambitions required to create a game as cutting edge as Final Fantasy VII by pushing the limitations of the Super NES. The studio even cut its teeth creating the pre-rendered computer-based visuals so central to Final Fantasy VII's success by collaborating with Nintendo to create a 16-bit RPG based on Mario. So the news in 1996 that Squaresoft had defected to Sony's camp and would be releasing the next Final Fantasy for PlayStation hit fans of the Nintendo Final Fantasy legacy hard, inspiring either deep disappointment or a sense of betrayed resentment, depending on how personally you take corporate maneuverings. For many fans, it was a swerve out of nowhere. Nintendo aficionados felt entitled to Final Fantasy VII. Besides the two brands' long-shared legacy, Square had already teased the game on N64, hadn't they? Well, not exactly. Back in 1995, Square had presented a demo of a potential future direction for Final Fantasy, a silicon graphics-powered 3D combat sequence in which a party of heroes battled trademark monsters with fully animated melee and spell attacks as a dynamic camera swooped around in a decidedly cinematic fashion. This was strictly a proof-of-concept demo, with different combat commands activated by elaborate mouse inputs, and the playable part in question featuring 3D models of Kazuko Shibuya's super-deformed designs from Final Fantasy VI. Despite these details, many in the press, and on the budding fan sites beginning to emerge in the proto-internet of 1995, represented the SIGGRAPH demo as a Final Fantasy VII preview. And because it ran on SGI workstations, the same platform from which N64's hardware had been derived, this was taken to mean Final Fantasy VII would be coming to N64. This of course never happened, though it did kick off a long legacy of Squaresoft presenting ideas through tech demos it had no intention on following up on. For example, they showed off the power of PlayStation 2 by creating a real-time rendition of Final Fantasy VIII's pre-rendered ballroom movie. There was Agni's Prophecy, a stunning visual demo that is yet to become a game. Oh, and let's not forget 2005's infamous Final Fantasy VII real-time technical demo for PlayStation 3, which of course amounted to nothing. But no, the existence of SGI-powered polygonal Final Fantasy VI characters wailing on a behemoth in 1995 did not amount to a Final Fantasy VI sequel on N64 in 1997. Instead, the game became a tentpole release for competitor Sony, a visual stunning work that showcased the potential of PlayStation arguably better than any game before it. It also landed a devastating blow to N64's long-term prospects, especially in Japan, where Final Fantasy and role-playing games in general were big business. Sony released Final Fantasy VII as a first-party title and gave it an elaborate marketing campaign, which included an American print ad that essentially recommended everyone responsible for the decision to retain solid-state media for N64 be lined up and summarily executed. Ah, 90s marketing. So classy. Uh -oh. <laughs> But in truth, Final Fantasy VII couldn't have existed on N64, not in the form Square envisioned, anyway. 
spanning three CD-ROMs crammed with hundreds of elaborate static background images and half an hour of pre-rendered full-motion video movies, Final Fantasy VII couldn't realistically have been compressed to fit down onto a cartridge. And that was the source of the company's schism all along. Despite their buddy-buddy outward appearances, Squaresoft's creative teams had chafed at the limitations of Nintendo's cartridge media throughout most of the Super NES's lifetime. Square had set its sight on the Super NES's highly anticipated PlayStation CD-ROM add-on as a means through which to finally explore their creative impulses without compromises to music, storytelling, and volume of content. When the Nintendo PlayStation project fell through, Square was forced to rein in its ambitions, resulting in obviously cramped and scaled-back projects like Trials of Mana. Final Fantasy VII then represents half a decade of pent-up ambition and creative yearning bursting all at once. As such, it's messy, sprawling, often confusing, and frequently inconsistent. Yet, it's impressive all the same. And everything great and daring about Final Fantasy VII can be found in its lengthy prologue sequence, which takes place entirely within the boundaries of a decaying megalopolis called Midgar. The Midgar sequence barely touches on what most people think of as a role-playing game in the traditional sense. It's entirely linear, with few opportunities to truly role-play. You can name your characters, and sometimes the player is given choices to determine protagonist Cloud Strife's responses to dialogue prompts, but these have little real impact on the gameplay beyond determining whom Cloud takes on an amusement park date hours later. But even if Midgard doesn't quite match the platonic vision of a role-playing adventure, it's nevertheless a singular work in game design and world building. In 1997, there had definitely never been an RPG quite like this. The closest thing would probably have been Atlas's Shin Megami Tensei series, which had barely taken its first tentative steps into the US thanks to Revelation's Persona, and which to that point had been built around the extremely traditional role-playing paradigm of the dungeon crawler. No, Midgard's antecedents really came from outside a video game. Hollywood films like Blade Runner and The Running Man, William Gibson's sprawl novels, anime like Akira and Neon Genesis Evangelion. These are works set in dystopian cyberpunk cities, brimming with technology and promise, yet beset by inequality, governmental collapse, and corporate control with little regard for human well-being. These shaped the world of Midgar and defined it. Far from the generic fantasy towns of traditional RPGs, Midgar feels like a crumbling version of Tokyo. Elevated highways and rail systems scurry along the bustling city above to tick away for the benefit of the malign corporation that rises from the center of Midgar's spoken hub layout, serving and powering the Shinra Corporation. At least, until its owners choose to cast away Midgar and its people in pursuit of greater untapped wealth. The destitute slums and bustling shanty towns in the lower portions of Midgar speak to Shinra's utter disregard for humanity. The citizens beneath the city's plates are only of interest to Shinra's executives and enforcers so long as they help fund the company's corruption or assist its greater ambitions. And when a team of useful idiots comes along in the form of the avalanche terror group that Cloud falls in with at the beginning of the game, Shinra is only too happy to snuff out countless lives, both above and below one of the city's eight plates in order to frame the terrorist cell. The plate's collapse wipes out most of Avalanche, but that almost seems incidental to the opportunity affords Shinra to tighten its grip on the city, increase the costs of the goods it provides, and hasten the development of a new, even more profitable city. Between a puppet government controlled by corporate purse strings, Shinra's willing and harmful exploitation of the environment, and its executives' gleeful false flag efforts, Final Fantasy VII's Midgar prologue feels downright ripped from the headlines of 2020. Like the best art, it holds up remarkably well to critical readings decades after its debut. But even in its time, Midgar was brilliant. For one thing, it was cleverly tuned for the wider, more mainstream audience Final Fantasy VII attracted compared to its predecessors. Critics tend to tear into Final Fantasy VII for how little it resembles a true RPG in the traditional stats and numbers and spells sense, and much of this criticism stems from how heavily the Midgar sequence front loads linear storytelling and pre-baked characters over the hallmarks of RPG design. Sure, you acquire some new equipment and level up a bit, but Final Fantasy VII has a story to tell, and it tamps down its RPG mechanics in service of that narrative. The entire game begins in medias res with a brilliant bit of camera work and cross-cut editing that contrasts the eerie near silence of space with the face of a young woman who appears to be warming herself in the light of a strange fire. Though we don't actually meet her in game for a while, FF7 uses her as a focal point for its big Midgar reveal. The camera pulls out to demonstrate the enormous size of the city before zooming back in on a different focal point. As the camera swoops in, the scene cuts back and forth between the zoom and a tracking shot of a train. 
Eventually, as the wide view comes closer to the city interior, it becomes evident that the game's point of view is coming to rest on that same train, which pulls into a train station. Seamlessly, characters leap into action, knocking out a handful of soldiers who hurry toward the train. A bulky man tells his companion to follow him, and the player is given control of protagonist Cloud Strife, only to be accosted by more guards. It's a fight you can't lose, as Cloud proves to be vastly stronger than his foes, and once the battle ends we see why. The skirmish boosts Cloud's experience level from 6 to 7. We've seen this technique in the series before, all the way back to Final Fantasy IV and its hero, Captain Cecil Harvey. The use of character stats to give a sense of their current place in life and their experience as a warrior. It had never been used so dramatically as it was here. There's no forming up a guild of level 1 recruits as in Wizardry or Ultima. Cloud is already at level 7, and the guild, in this case the terror cell Avalanche, was formed ahead of time, so you can play through Cloud's first adventure with the group. Though it's clearly not Cloud's first adventure, what with his being level 7 already. The game provides all the setup and context you need later, once the initial bombing mission is complete. You meet the flower girl, Eris, before making your way back to Avalanche's headquarters to get a better sense of the group's mission, and a clearer understanding that Cloud was roped into the mission by an old childhood friend, Tifa. Over the next few hours, Final Fantasy VII steadily leads players through the slums of Midgar, introducing them to a world run by Shinra at great peril to its populace. While there's a fair amount of RPG-style turn-based combat to be undertaken here, the battles are clearly a secondary priority for the creators, who are far more interested in setting up the game's world along with its core characters and conflicts. Eventually, the game moves well beyond Midgar and starts to feel more like a traditional RPG, with a large overworld in which points of interest are seen at an abstract reduced scale, players are pulled into constant random battle encounters, and a number of optional locations to visit and quests to undertake appear. The Midgar portion of Final Fantasy VII, however, is far more focused on driving home the point that this is not your typical stodgy role-playing game. On the contrary, FF7 cheerfully incorporates elements from any number of other genres of the era. The infiltration of and escape from Shinra headquarters in particular feels like an attempt to stretch FF7 well beyond the boundaries of the role-playing tradition. You have a Resident Evil-style puzzle in which you inexplicably assemble a model of the city in order to access another floor of the Shinra skyscraper. You also have one of the annoying, arbitrary stealth minigames that were cropping up in games around this time as well. Eventually, you naturally end up jailed, as usual. And once you reach the top of Shinra's tower, and things go horribly wrong, you escape the city with a fully 3D, running motorcycle battle in which you fend off attackers in real time, with the damage inflicted on your party during the sequence determining the team's health once they reach the end of the line and face off against Midgar's final boss. All of these elements aren't simply distractions, they're sleight of hand. Midgar is an extended tutorial for role-playing newcomers, dressed up with sleek visuals and intersecting with familiar hits from beyond the RPG milieu. Making your way through Midgar gives players a taste of the workings of RPGs. Newcomers are introduced to menu-driven combat with a real-time element, while also giving returning fans a taste of the familiar. For all of Final Fantasy VII's technical changes, the game still fundamentally plays out like the three 16-bit Final Fantasy games, bringing forward the active time battle system. And as in Final Fantasy VI, the party in each character's combat class is largely downplayed in favor of a flexible skill system, Materia. Each character combat role is primarily expressed through their choice of weapon and by their limit breaks, special skills that become available once a character has sustained sufficient injury in battle. Cloud plays somewhere between a paladin and a samurai with his sword techniques, while Barret, at least initially, uses ranged attacks that put him closer in style to an archer. Tifa's brawling attacks and limit break combo strikes pin her as a monk, while Eris's weak staff strikes and healing focused limit breaks make her a white mage. But these roles aren't fixed. Even in the early going, characters can take whatever role the player desires by using Materia. Materia are color-coded stones that can be inserted to slots on each character's weapon and confer special skills, including magic spells, to that fighter. It might make the most sense to give Cloud the paladin-like cover Materia to cause him to take damage in place of weaker allies, but you could also stick it on Tifa or even the physically frail Eris. Conversely, Eris is the logical choice to carry Recover Materia, which makes the healing spell Cure available. But you could give it to Tifa or Barret instead even though they have pitiful spirit stats compared to Eris and Cloud. Materia allows players immense flexibility in combat, and it grows even more useful once you begin to link spells with support skills like All, which allows players to cast a spell on an entire group of foes or allies. And each piece of Materia gains its own experience with use, eventually leveling up to unlock new capabilities. Juggling Materia between all your characters at the end of the Shinra infiltration sequence, once the party's ranks swell to five, two more that can be active in combat at any given time, demonstrates both the flexibility and the frustrations of the Materia system. You can prep your characters for any scenario, but you also spend as much time fumbling through menus as you do actually battling monsters with the skills you've set up. 
Still, the clunky exposition and setup around party switching that undermines the tension of your Escape from Shinner HQ serves to introduce players to the concept of a party roster and strategizing your team makeup, the fundamental pillars of RPGs, and something of vital importance here, all the way through the game's final battle dozens of hours later. Likewise, the goofy wall market event midway through the Midgar story in which you take time out of your efforts to reunite with Avalanche after meeting Eris in order to dress Cloud and Drag introduces players to concepts like quest chains and key items. It also helps to find the world of Midgar by giving you a glimpse into the spaces where its people live, even if those spaces seem a little seedy. Wall market feels like a 90s Japanese metropolis meets 70s New York, a space straight out of Neuromancer or Blade Runner. It's full of steamy noodle joints where customers crowd together at a narrow counter, questionable pharmacies run by disinterested owners, sleazy hotels where couples are encouraged to pay by the hour, and clothing shops happy to cater to all manner of interests and proclivities. Cloud and Eris' romp through the wall market also feels like a statement of defiance, a showcase of what Final Fantasy could be once freed of Nintendo's content standards and restrictions. Even in Japan, it's hard to imagine a Super Famicom or N64 RPG that could have featured something like Cloud challenging a cross-dressing gym owner for a wig so he could present himself as a prospective sexual conquest for a grotesque pimp who serves as a sort of underworld enforcer for the villains. Locations like the Honeybee Manor feel every bit as much like a realization of what Final Fantasy could be on PlayStation as does, say, a seamless FMV transition into playable action, or a cool climactic video of the heroes escaping a corporate empire's headquarters on a motorcycle. Finally, Square's creative teams have the technical power and the creative freedom to realize their ambitions and reflect their influences. The Midgar sequence plays out as a cyberpunk heist film. Following their initial assault on the Shinra power reactor, the members of Avalanche become wanted criminals, scheming their next attack while evading corporate security. But they are quickly outmaneuvered by the corporation, which takes advantage of Avalanche's next assault to wipe out the terror cell, begin the demolition of Midgar, and abduct the woman who holds the key to the company's future, who happens to be Eris, the same flower girl Cloud keeps bumping into. The surviving members of Avalanche storm Shinra headquarters, or else sneak up 60 floors of stairs, much to team leader Barrett's consternation, to rescue Eris, only to be kidnapped themselves. But things suddenly go very wrong for Shinra, whose leader is assassinated off-camera by a much greater threat to the world, which allows Cloud and his companions to escape and make their way into the sequel, or rather, into the game proper, or bringing it full circle into the next chapter of the remake. Final Fantasy VII has received plenty of not undeserved criticism for the way its creators occasionally got carried away with technical excess. The further you play into the game, the more its flashy high-level spell effects and monster summon animations drag down the pace of battles. But if Square's team allowed themselves to get swept up in the excitement of showing off their flashy technical tricks, their more subtle efforts tend to go overlooked. The entire world of Midgar is depicted through static backgrounds that combine computer renderings, hand-tuned illustration, and real-time lighting effects, and it's gorgeous. Every scene of the city is crammed with detail, from the clutter of a slumtown bedroom to the decaying wiring of a toxic reactor to the austere precision of a corporate skyscraper. Final Fantasy VII feels a world removed from the repetitive, tiled environments of 16-bit RPGs, and lovingly crafted details spill over in every room and building you can enter, however needlessly. There's some clever use of PlayStation tech here, too. The cold glow of neon and electric lighting subtly affects both the soft pre-render backgrounds and the slightly jagged real-time polygonal character models in the same way, helping to unify these visually disjointed elements. There's also much to be said for the fun transitions between sequences. Consider the FMB cutscene of the Shinra building's security room, where a snoozing guard fails to notice Cloud stepping out of an elevator on one of his monitors. The game's point of view notices, though, and it zooms in on the screen, which dissolves into the real-time controllable action. Or take the elevator battle as you make your way down the length of Shinra HQ. The battle begins with a standard transition pan, showcasing the environment of the battle before depicting the glass walls of the elevator being shot out by an enemy keeping pace with the party's descent in the opposite elevator. Final Fantasy VII loses a lot of its cohesion and sense of purpose once players move away from Midgar. It becomes more of a standard RPG with plenty of roaming and endless waves of random combat. And even in Midgar, it's hardly perfect. For example, the breathtaking sequence which sees Cloud climbing the frayed wreckage left behind by the collapse of the city plate, framed by a continuous pan in front of the smoldering ruin of the devastated city, is undermined by the need to plug batteries into random devices and perform a jump on a weirdly timed swinging object. The beautifully staged static environments can be annoyingly hard to read at times, to the point that the game will point out the location of exits if you press the select key. Real-time events like dropping barrels onto soldiers from the rafters of a church end up being trial and error nonsense. 
And there's a strange tendency for save points to be spaced unreasonably far apart during certain point of no return story sequences, making it difficult to save your progress to stop playing. Still, for all of Final Fantasy VII's many imperfections, it's not hard to understand why the game remains one of the best-selling RPGs and PlayStation titles of all time. It made an enormous impact upon its arrival in 1997, luring millions of fresh-faced young gamers into the role-playing genre a full year before Pokemon arrived in the West. Midgar feels like a fully realized place, a setting rich and detailed enough to play host to an entire game. In fact, 23 years later, that's literally the case. The new PlayStation 4 remake series begins with an entire first chapter built as a standalone, full-length recreation and expansion of the Midgar prologue. The Final Fantasy VII remake feels like Final Fantasy as it was always conceived, while also being informed by the design and mechanical sensibilities of the games Final Fantasy VII inspired. The remake could never have existed on the original PlayStation, just as the original Final Fantasy VII could never have existed on Nintendo 64. And hey, that's fair. As we'll see throughout Nintendo 64 works, the console broke new ground and revolutionized gaming in entirely different ways. The Nintendo Final Fantasy schism of the 32-bit era has ultimately proven to be less of a big deal because of long-forgotten and patched over corporate disputes and rivalries, and more of a big deal for the way it helped diversify a rapidly maturing medium in new and interesting ways. Next time on N64 Works Gaiden, maybe someday I'll find 100 hours to invest into recording Dragon Warrior 7 to talk about the other great Nintendo RPG schism. Then again, probably not.